Good evening, everyone. My name is Tanya Winders, and I'm the President and Chief Executive Officer of Allergy and Asthma Network, the co-host of this evening's webinar on latex allergy. It is my pleasure to welcome all of you this evening, and I would like to first recognize some of our presenting sponsors and partners for this evening's webinar. First, I'd like to say a huge thank you to the American Latex Allergy Association with Sue Lockwood and Marcia Smith as leadership. These ladies have been instrumental in helping us to plan and execute the webinar this evening, and we enjoy working with their organization in raising awareness for latex allergy. I'd also like to say thank you to Mylan, the manufacturer of EpiPen, who did provide an educational sponsorship for this evening's latex allergy webinar. Next, I'd like to thank the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, who is also co-hosting our event this evening. All lines will be muted, and we will open it up for questions along the way. Should you have any questions as the presenter goes through, you may raise your hand or ask the question in the control panel, and I will present that to the presenter at that given time. We will open all lines at the conclusion of the call for you all to ask any questions you may wish. Now, as we get started, I'd like to welcome our presenter for this evening. Dr. Sandra Gawchick is from Upland, Pennsylvania. She is the co-chief at Crozen Keystone Health System, co-chief of allergy and immunology at Crozen Keystone Health System. She is a graduate of the College of Osteopathic Medicine at Kansas City and completed her fellowship in allergy and immunology at Thomas Jefferson University. She completed her residency in pediatrics at St. Christopher's in, Pencil in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and is a fellow of both the American Academy of Pediatrics, the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, and the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. She has been ranked as a top doctor for many years, but most recently, again, in 2000 and 2000, 2013 and 2014. Dr. Gotchik's areas of interest include asthma and latex allergy. She has served with the Latex Allergy Association as well as many leadership roles in the specialty of allergy and immunology. And so at this time, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Gotchik and welcome her and thank her for attending and for presenting this evening. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Tanya. I'm delighted to be here. I want to thank the American Latex Allergy Association for inviting me to do this presentation on latex allergy. And my first slide talks about my disclosures. And Tanya, would you advance that, please? And basically, I have no specific um, problems as far as um, financial pr difficulties with any of these. These are examples of people I've done research, advisory board, and clinical research. My next slide. What I'm going to do today, as we know, latex allergy really has not gone away. It is still a problem in today's present age. And we have patients who suffer not only from latex allergy, but have latex anaphylaxis. What I'm going to do today is cover the historical aspects of latex allergy, talk about the specific latex allergens, symptoms, how we make a diagnosis and treatment. And what I would like to do is I would like to begin with a case presentation because I'd like all of us to think about this particular individual who's having a problem. And she is Linda, who's been an ICU nurse for approximately 10 years. She loves her job and she is proud of her expertise. She's come to my office because she has had two anaphylactic episodes in the past year while she's been at work. She wonders what's her problem. She tells me that her hospital has referred her for evaluation because they don't know what's causing her anaphylactic reaction. She also tells me she's had many symptoms of allergic uh, rhinitis, hay fever over several years, but the symptoms have increased in the past year. She also reports that certain fruits and vegetables cause her to have an itchy mouth and throat and make her feel choked up. She notes that she's had an intermittent problem with asthma, but more recently her asthma has caused her more trouble. She notes while she was in work the fall of this year, she went into the ICU where she works. She donned her usual clubs and her clothes and her vinyl gloves and put on a mask and went in to suction a patient's ET tube. 
Within minutes, her face became swollen and itchy. She had to leave the patient's room. She collapsed, needed epinephrine, and was taken to the emergency room. She had not used latex gloves, and latex gloves were not in her vicinity. She wants to know what's causing her problems. And as I go through today's webinar, I'll tell you a little bit of more information about what happened to Linda. Okay, so now as far as historical aspects, which is my next slide, the discovery of latex rubber occurred many, many uh, decades ago. In fact, archaeologists were able to uncover at, in Mesoamerica at Mayan archaeological sites latex rubber items, including tools that were crafted and covered with latex rubber on their handles and various figurines. And when archaeologists carbon dated the products, they noted they dated back to 1600 BC. Spanish explorers coming to the New World found this elastic material to be quite interesting and brought it back to Europe. In 17, 1777, Joseph Priestley wrote with a lead pencil but was able to rub it out with a rubber eraser. In 1823, rubber was used in the rain gear industry for the first time by Mr. Macintosh. And we all have our Macintoshes. And what the original Macintosh was fabric covered with rubber. In 1839, Goodyear further developed rubber by improving its stability by vulcanization, improving its elasticity and its thermal stability. And in 1888, the tire industry developed. What's fascinating to me is that John Hopkins in 1989, Dr. Halstead developed a latex, had a latex glove or a rubber glove developed for one of his employees, a nurse who became allergic to carbolic acid, and carbolic acid was the treatment of choice that nurses had to use to prevent infections prior to surgery. And this nurse, which was his favorite nurse, developed a reaction to the carbolic acid, so he had the gloves made for her. An interesting side to the story is Dr. Halstead later married this nurse. And Hopkins was the first to use latex gloves and the first to stop using them to have a latex-free environment. In the 1990s, there were over 40,000 latex products in the United States and worldwide. So there are more than 40,000 latex-containing products worldwide. My next slide talks about um, not only uh, the history of latex allergy, but when it first developed. So let's go back to that slide. In the history of latex allergy, in 1927, the first report of latex allergy was shown by Stern, who noted it in rubber dental prosthesis in one of his patients who developed laryngeal edema. He also noted asthma in an electrical line, line worker who, when he was working on the electrical line, heated it up and inhaled the fumes from rubber and had an asthma attack. In 1933, Danny described contact dermatitis in electrical company linemen, first reported cases. And in 1979, rubber gloves were used throughout the United States by housewives. And Nutter reported the first case of urticaria in a housewife who was using rubber gloves. As you may all be aware, in 1987, OSHA universal precautions, bloodborne protection was required, and rubber gloves were needed. As a result, the manufacture of rubber gloves and latex, i.e. gloves, increased. In 1996, there were 1,600 reports of allergic or anaphylactic reactions by the FD, to the FDA for latex, and 22 of these were from latex cuff barium enemas, and one was due to uh, latex gloves. Um, there, in 2012, there were 200 uh, latex allergic reactions reported to the FDA. My next slide talks about where does latex come from. And what you see in this slide is a picture of a rubber tree being tapped, similar to how you would tap maple syrup. The difference is the sap from the rubber tree, referred to as Heva brasiliensis, is a milky white sap and it looks like milk. It comes from Malaysia, Sri Lanka, Thailand, and India. This is where most of the plantations are. When it drops, when the latex is collected in this cup, ammonia and other agents are placed, and there are three layers that are centrifuged out. The first layer contains rubber, the middle layer contains uh, 
the C serum, and the lower layer contains the B serum. This contains the latex allergenic proteins. And on our next slide, we talk about the fact that there are over 250 natural latex polypeptides. Of those 250 latex polypeptides, there are 60 that have an IgE-mediated antibody. However, only 15 have been numbered and nomenclatured by the International Committee, and the, of these, 13 are listed. And what's interesting about these HEV-B proteins is that HEV-B1 and HEV-B3 are the proteins that are commonly found in patients who have a spina bifida because these are the proteins that are eludated out in the mucous membrane. Healthcare workers are allergic to HEV-B5 through HEV-B7. And those who have the latex fruit allergy syndrome where they're allergic not only to latex but maybe allergic to fruits are allergic to HEV-B8 and HEV-B12. Our next slide talks about the prevalence of latex allergy. And if we look at the prevalence, latex allergy impacts approximately 3 million Americans, approximately 1% of our general population. And there are 15 million worldwide who suffer from latex allergy. And the potential could be growing due to the use of latex gloves that are powdered in areas that are third world countries. Now if we look at the percentage of patients who react, our spina bifida patients have a 37 to 68 percent chance of being allergic to latex. If we look at our spina bifida patients who are in Singapore, 46 percent of those where powdered latex gloves are still being used continue to be allergic. Whereas in the United States where we have stopped using powdered latex gloves and stopped using latex gloves on these patients who have spina bifida, the incidence has fallen to 1 percent. Healthcare workers have an incidence of 8 to 17 percent of being allergic to latex. And in rubber industry where individuals are not only tapping uh, the rubber trees, or they may be working in the rubber doll industry or making rubber toys or other rubber devices, there's 11% incidence of allergy. In the atopic population, there's a 6.8% incidence of reaction to latex. And in fact, Ownby, an investigator who's an allergist, studied 1,000 blood samples and found that approximately 6 to 8 percent of the population is sensitized to latex, but he didn't look at whether they were symptomatic. Multiple surgeries, multiple surgeries, greater than five, and most of the literature talks about patients having eight to ten surgeries, putting them at risk for becoming latex allergic. Our concern today is this Ebola outbreak has resulted in the use of latex gloves at an exponential rate in third world countries. So there may be a greater increase in latex allergies in these areas. Now my next slide talks about why. Why is this latex allergy occurring and why did it in fact happen? Well, universal precautions resulted in an increased demand for latex gloves. And what did that increased demand look like? We went from 800 million gloves per year to 20 billion a year. As a result, they needed to develop other sources to collect latex, and they needed more latex or rubber tree plantations. So as a result, not only was the product coming from Indochina, it was coming from the Philippines and South America. As a result, there was a change in quality control. There was a shorter storage time, Younger trees were being tapped for latex, meaning that they had to receive stimulating chemicals to cause them to produce more latex. The average age of a tree that's tapped is five to seven years of age, and it can be tapped for up to 30 years. Now, what ends up happening is when we are collecting uh, the latex from the rubber tree, as we showed, it's collected in that pan, and various chemicals, including ammonia, carbamate, cyrans, are added. This is then collected and taken to the manufacturing plant where uh, porcelain formers are utilized and these porcelain formers are dipped into the latex, then they're oven baked, then they're sort of rolled through a, a bread roll system 
they are then dipped into a leaching tank where they're washed and then they're reheated by a vulcanization system and then they're powdered and taken off the porcelain formers. Now what happened is when the storage time was shortened because in the prior years, prior to 1987, the storage time could be many months for the latex in tanks. Now it was like one or two months and then it was shipped off to the manufacturing sites. That means that the latex gloves had a higher incidence of increased latex protein adherent to the cornstarch powder that was placed on the gloves as they were removed from the porcelain former. The other thing that happened is people started becoming increasingly aware that there may be a problem with the latex gloves. Now my next slide please. So what was the additional reason for increased allergy? Well you had patients who were working in the healthcare system who not only had asthma but also had allergic rhinitis or eczema. They were increasingly exposed to the latex allergens and what I recall when I was a resident is that individuals would love to take off their gloves and they would snap them and what you would see as they snapped off the glove was this powder going into the air. That meant that healthcare workers were inhaling the allergen and the allergen in the particulate cornstarch because the latex adheres to the cornstarch powder was adhering to their clothing and they were inhaling it and it was adhering to fabric as well as countertops in the healthcare setting. As you see, hand dermatitis also developed in these individuals and in many it progressed on to further problems. We also found that food allergy, especially to what they called the back fruits, banana, avocado, kiwi, and chestnut, basically correlated with the latex allergy. We also note that patients who had spina bifida or urinary tract mal malformations were exposed to latex at a very early age and they had impactions removed multiple times. So these individuals were at great risk and some of the first cases of anaphylaxis to latex were reported in this group of patients. Also individuals who had multiple surgeries, eight to 10. Now our next slide looks at the routes of sensitization. Inhalation of the powder is shown on this latex glove here. Mucous membrane contact and the reason for this is the protein on the latex gloves is diluted with moisture. So when the glove is wet, the mucous membrane contact with the latex gloves cause the patient to become exposed to that protein and therefore become sensitized. The same with intraperitoneal operations, the same thing happens. With abraded skin, over time, the skin becomes more and more abraded. So frequently, Nursing professionals would continue to use their gloves despite the fact that their hands were broken down and the protein could be absorbed across the broken down skin membrane. And then patients receiving drugs through latex ports could become sensitized over time. Our next slide talks about where latex products are found in the medical setting. And what you see here is a list of products from gloves to intravenous tubing, goggles, wood dra wound drains and tubes, dental dams, hand grips, face masks, mattresses on stretchers, bulb syringes, tourniquets, catheters, EKG electrodes, respirators, multi-dose vial tops for medications, elastic in hospital clothing, adhesive tapes, amber bags, and patient controlled analgesic syringes. All of these in the medical setting have an FDA warning that it contains latex. However, there is no FDA warning that says an item is latex safe. That's very critical. So medical setting, FDA warning on these type products. My next slide looks at latex products in the home setting. And this is a potential product problem for many of our patients who are latex allergic. It's the dip products which are similar to latex gloves that are dipped with a porcelain former into the latex solution that create the greatest problems. These are balloons, condoms, douche bulbs, all of these are potential problems and you can see the picture to the left. Bandages, erasers, hot water bottles, rubber toys, sports equipment, especially the handles on tennis rackets, sanitary incontinence pads, buttons, electronic equipment, 
disposable diapers, com computer mouse pads, baby bottle nipples, and the elastic bands that are shown up here, the rubber bands. I had one patient who became sensitized because her orthodontist still used rubber bands on her orthodontic appliances and she became quite sensitive to all latex products through this method. Eyedropper bulbs, elastic and clothing, adhesive shoes and rubber gloves all in the home setting. The rubber gloves you wash dishes are not labeled, do not have an FDA warning containing latex. So this is a dilemma. You really have to contact the American Latex Association to get a list of products that are safe. Our next slide um, talks about occupations where latex is used. Now we know healthcare workers are exposed, but what is little known is that food handlers and restaurant workers often use powdered latex gloves. They not only put themselves at risk, but they put the people who eat their food at risk because the latex protein is transmitted to the food. Remember, it can be eluded in a moist, watery environment, and the powder, if they're using powdered latex gloves, transfers the protein to food. So an unsuspecting latex allergic individual eating these foods could have a reaction. Domestic workers in the hospital setting, in the home setting, use latex gloves. Hairdressers use latex gloves to dye and to do other processes in the beauty industry. Security personnel, construction workers, greenhouse workers, gardeners, florists using latex tape as well as latex gloves in that industry. Funeral workers, rubber plantation workers, actors because of the costumes they wear and models because of the various makeups. So all of these you have to be aware of. If you have a patient who comes in who's having an anaphylactic reaction, you would want to consider this as a potential problem or a reason for their problem. Our next slide talks about a specific another patient. Um, we talked about Linda first, but I want to add Sheila in here because Sheila is another female nurse who happens to be a patient of mine who contacted my office because she noted that she was at her child's birthday party and she was blowing up a balloon and her lip and tongue swelled and she shortly thereafter developed asthma symptoms. She tells me that she has seasonal allergic rhinitis and she also has asthma but her asthma is currently not well controlled. She had hand dermatitis in nursing school and continued to use the latex gloves in nursing school despite the hand dermatitis. And when she went on to work in, at the state prison as a nurse, she found that when she used latex gloves, she developed urticaria under the site where the latex gloves were. And if she touched her face, she would develop a hive. She now tells me that she's no longer working in the prison, but she finds that when she eats certain foods, she develops especially fruits and vegetables. She gets an itchy mouth, an itchy throat, she has vomiting and diarrhea and abdominal complaints. She recently went to the beauty parlor and had hair extensions put in and she noted after the hair extensions were placed, she had to go home and go to bed and take all of her asthma medicines and start on prednisone because her asthma was totally, under, totally out of control but she didn't know what the problem was and her main reason for coming to the office was because blowing up the balloon caused her lips and tongue to swell. Now let's look at the next slide because the next slide gives us a little bit of information of what potentially could have been going on with um, Sheila. First of all, we see natural rubber latex has a cross reactivity between foods. And if you're allergic to natural rubber latex, you have a 35% risk of a reaction to one of the following foods. And you can see here kiwi, banana, peach, avocado, chestnut, fig, and bell pepper, tomato, and white potato. And Sheila said she often couldn't eat foods that were brought into her place of work because she never knew if any of the salads contained any of these foods. Now if you look, if the patient is allergic to these foods, they have 11% risk of a reaction to latex. So it can go more that the patient who's latex allergic is allergic to the foods, but a percentage who have the food allergy can develop a reaction to latex. And Carlos Blanco, an investigator in Spain, says that 50% of his patients who have the food reaction um, go on to develop anaphylaxis, so he's sure that all of them have epinephrine. Our next slide just gives you a uh, quick overview of the oral allergy pollen 
syndrome, which will be addressed tomorrow evening. And the key is that there's IgE reactivity to the panallergen profilin, and many of these patients can be positive or negative to IgE to the natural rubber latex, or they can be negative to natural rubber latex by the IgE antibody test. Tomorrow night, Tom will cover all of this, so I'm not going to address this. I'm going to move over this slide. <clears throat> Our next slide is just a quick picture so you can look at these foods and fruits once more. But the one thing I want to point out is a lot of people who are interested in health have started drinking the goji berry. And the goji berry cross-reacts very strongly with latex as well as cherry, which are basically marketed as antioxidants and they can improve your health. So keep in mind if you have somebody who's drinking these products and they become symptomatic, you might, may want to caution them about the potential of developing latex allergy. Now, our next slide talks about the various types of reactions that an individual who is exposed to latex may develop. The first is irritant contact dermatitis, which is non-IgE mediated. The second is a type 1 IgE mediated hypersensitivity. And the third is a type 4 delayed hypersensitivity reaction. My first slide is a picture of a irritant contact dermatitis to uh, natural rubber latex. This is not IgE mediated and this is due to repetitive hand washing, the detergent that may not be carefully removed from the skin when it's applied, and the occlusive nature of the latex glove. And this can also occur, occur after using vinyl gloves. So it's irritant, it's non-allergic, and the skin becomes dry, irritated, and or fissured. The problem here is that the, if the person continues to use the glove and the skin continues to be irritated and abraded, they have the potential of absorbing the latex protein across the broken down skin and potentially becoming allergic to the product, as was Sheila's case when she was in nursing school. And she was the first case I presented. Now, natural rubber latex allergy, the type 1 hypersensitivity reaction, that's an immediate reaction to the natural rubber latex proteins. It's due to histamine release, and you get systemic symptoms of contact urticaria at the site where the gloves are worn, or if you were to touch a gloved finger to your face, you could develop a hive. In the 1990s, nurses used to go into the emergency room setting and suddenly they had runny, itchy, watery nose and eyes, and then they progressed throughout the day to have wheezing symptoms. Many thought their symptoms were due to hay fever and didn't correlate it to the latex allergen that was present in their environment. The next slide talks about the various IgE symptoms that we see in our patients. These include hives or swelling, like the swelling of the lips and tongue of Sheila when she blew up the latex balloon runny nose, frequently seen, sneezing, headache, red, itchy, watery eyes, and a hoarse voice throat or something stuck in the throat, or abdominal cramps resulting in diarrhea, as uh, Sheila had after eating various fruits and vegetables, sore throat, hoarseness, chest tightness, wheezing, shortness of breath, and anaphylaxis as our nurse Sheila and also our nurse uh, Linda who was in the who had anaphylaxis after walking out of the room in the ICU. Now our next slide shows a picture of contact dermatitis. This is a little bit different. This only occurs in the place where the gloves are applied. So when you take the gloves off, you will see the rash in the distribution where the gloves basically contact the skin. And this is due to a type 4 reaction, and it's T-cell mediated. My next slide shows this. And the response occurs anywhere from 48 to 96 hours after exposure. And the reaction is to processing chemicals used in the natural rubber latex product. And these are accelerators such as thiuram, mercaptan, benzothiazole, carbamates, and antioxidants, phenylendiamine. For you ladies out there, phenylendiamine is a black dye that's used in hair dye, and for the men, it's found in the color cones. So individuals who were developing the contact dermatitis developed it to these chemicals, and it's localized to the area of contact. Our next slide talks about how do we make that diagnosis? How is latex allergy diagnosed? 
Well, the first thing is you have to, you know, find out what kind of symptoms they have, and usually they have an allergic reaction, skin rash, hives, eye tearing, runny, itchy, watery nose, wheezing, itching, difficulty breathing when exposed to latex or natural rubber products. The key here is on our next slide. It's history, history, history. It's important to take a very good history. And if you're having trouble wondering what kind of questions you have to ask your patient in diagnosing latex allergy, if you go on American Latex Allergy and Asthma's website, they have a wonderful questionnaire you can download and hand out to your patients. And that questionnaire relates to the following. You want to ask if there's workplace associated exposure. For example, your healthcare workers, do they wear latex gloves at work? Do they have a history of eczema or asthma? Um, do they have, have they had uh, frequent surgeries? And, you know, are they uh, having problems when they're blowing up a balloon like Sheila did? When they go to the dentist, do they have trouble? When they go to the gynecologist or if they have intercourse, are they having burning or itching or do they have a reaction with hives? Or in fact, do they start wheezing when they have an exam because latex gloves are used? Do they have problems with any of the associated foods? The key is there can be a progression of symptoms from contact dermatitis to contact urticaria to allergic rhinitis, asthma, then subsequently anaphylaxis. Our patient who had unexplained anaphylaxis, or Linda, who was the ICU nurse who was gowned up, wore a mask, and had non-latex gloves on who had anaphylaxis, where was she getting her exposure to? Our next slide. How do we make our diagnosis? Well, we looked at our history, and on Linda, I want to tell you where she made her exposure to latex was that her face mask that she was using when she went into her patient's room was housed in the same area where apparently latex gloves that were powdered were kept. This was unknown to Sheila because her co-workers were hiding the latex gloves behind the face mask that she was using, so her face mask was, contact, was contaminated with powdered latex. And this is why every time she put on a face mask, she developed an anaphylactic reaction. So it required a careful history taking. In order to do testing to see if the patient is latex allergic, we're sort of stuck in the United States. We have to do a careful history and look back at the history of the patient and basically do some detective work, which we had to do in Linda's case. But we can do specific Ig antibody tests, the FADIA immunocap, uh, the Siemens Immunolite autoanalyzer. Both of these tests have an approximate 70% sensitivity and a 95% specificity. However, if they have a negative test, it doesn't rule out the fact that they uh, have a latex allergy. In development is an immunocap uh, study, and that immunocap study uh, which is currently not available, will help to identify patients who have a specific sensitivity to latex allergy. There is no commercially available skin test in the United States. They are commercially available skin tests in Europe and in Canada by Ben Carard and Stallergen. Um, occasionally, doctors will try to make up latex extracts by soaking rubber gloves in a solution. This is dangerous because it can result in false negatives and results in anaphylaxis. And the reason for this is many gloves have different quantities of latex allergen in them. So uh, from a glove-to-glove -glove basis, you cannot quantify the amount of latex protein that's in them. In the patients who have contact allergy, uh, reliable testing that's available is shown on our next slide, and this is patch testing, which can be done to identify whether they're sensitive to any of these allergic contactants that are listed here. Our next slide talks about how we can treat our patients who have latex allergy. And the primary key is avoidance. Avoidance of powdered latex glove, which has always been the culprit in the past, it's helpful to use low-protein, latex, powder-free gloves if it's necessary. However, avoidance of latex glove is really critical in all settings. Medication should be provided for patients who have latex anaphylaxis, including an emergency kit with epinephrine. Immunotherapy um, 
is something we'll talk about in a minute, an education about the, of the patient as to how to avoid latex and where latex products uh, can be uh, where they can be exposed to latex products, both in the medical and home care setting, as I showed you early on. Now, a medical alert bracelet should be provided for everybody who's latex allergic. Our next slide. <clears throat> how to avoid? They should avoid latex gloves, balloons, and condoms. They also should avoid exposure to lectiferous plants that have cross-reactive proteins. There's over 2,000 of these, but the most common in the United States are the poinsettia, the rubber tree, and the crown of thorns that people may have in their house, and the aloe plant. Avoid uh, the cross-reactive foods, and remember that hidden transfer to foods with foods that are prepared with latex gloves, and latex gloves should not be used by workers who have no body fluid contact. <clears throat> Our next slide. Now, beauty can be dangerous, as previously mentioned, that phenylendiamine is used in hair dye, but it's also a contact allergen that's found in latex gloves. It's that type 4 reaction. But what was Sheila's problem? Why was Sheila constantly sick? Her extensions were applied with latex glue. So your patients who are having latex used in their hair to apply their hair extensions to look more beautiful are making them sick. Liquid latex is utilized in theatrical make makeup, as shown here. And Halloween is coming up, and you may have some patients coming into your practice who develop a contact urticaria. And if they do, they're at risk for latex anaphylaxis. So be very careful here. And waxing products, especially the um, Band-Aid or the stripping tape, may contain latex adhesive. And this is a risk for your patients. Other areas in the beauty industry are your eyelash curlers, which may or may not have latex and your sponges that are used to apply, matex, late, late, to apply matex, makeup, as well as um, the support that is put in latex, in, put in shoes. Now, in our female patients, we see a higher incidence of latex allergy because many undergo both obstetrical and gynecological procedures. And they account for 50% of reactions to natural rubber latex. And when we look at most of our patients who had anaphylaxis to latex, my two cases were female nurses. Most of my patients who had to give up their careers in the 90s due to latex allergy, doctors, nurses, and a dentist, were, a lot of them were females, and their exposure was encountered here. Our next slide talks about, uh, again, how to avoid, you need to educate your patients. What we see is the latex uh, allergy bracelet that the patient should have. Remember, your patient should have two auto-injections with epinephrine, the EpiPen. The reason is the immediate allergic reaction can progress to a late phase reaction that occurs in approximately 50% of patients. So always two EpiPens available, and the patient should be instructed how to use it. The patient should have their own first aid kit with these medicines in them, as well as non-latex gloves in their home and their vehicle in case they are encountered by paramedics who only have latex gloves. They should notify everybody, their family members, their friends, school, and their medical and dental providers that they're latex allergic in event that they need to be treated. Our next slide is, if you have patients, what do you want to tell them? If they develop latex allergy, they have to avoid latex. They have to advise everybody, including their coworkers. I had a patient who reacted because her coworker was using powdered latex gloves. The powder was on her clothing and on her hands. She didn't wash it off. She made food, served to my patient, and she had an allergic reaction. So these patients need to avoid latex gloves and products. They have to avoid areas where they may inhale the powder that comes off the latex gloves, off latex balloons, or other dip products, and they have to inform their medical professionals. Um, use non-latex gloves in all areas where you're not going to be exposed to infectious material, and do not use oil-based hand creams if you are using latex gloves because these deteriorate the gloves and elute the protein. Wash your and dry your hands thoroughly after removing latex gloves. 
if you are working in an area that's contaminated with latex gloves, you should shower and before you go home because you can bring the latex powder home. That's how children became allergic to latex when their parents, nurses, and doctors brought the powder into the household. And you want to become familiar with protocols for preventing latex allergy. Again, these are on the American Latex Allergy Association site, and I have this web address coming in, up in my next few si slides and learn to recognize latex allergy. This slide is important because it tells us where latex allergy has been promoted, the incidence of latex sensitization has decreased to 1% in our spina bifida patients. Our next slide, future treatments, sublingual immunotherapy has not proved to be a effective in uh, decreasing the incidence of latex allergy and in fact anaphylaxis has been reported with its use. Subcutaneous immunotherapy, there have been three trials, none of them were actually effective. Um, they resulted in decrease in urticaria and rhinoconjunctivitis in one but the patients continued to have asthma and have trouble and they were prone with risk for anaphylaxis. Anti-IG therapy is off-label and might be uh, a thought to utilize in a patient who has serious anaphylaxis due to latex, but it has not been studied. There are newer therapies in progress, but none of them have been um, shown any good evidence to date. So the conclu our conclusion is that latex allergy is common. It is a serious healthcare problem. We must be aware, as in both Sheila and Linda, both of these people in recent days have had anaphylaxis secondary to both exposure to latex glove, hair extensions, Linda in the ICU setting because she got exposed to latex gloves despite the fact um, that she was told there was no latex in her area and her hospital was unaware that the powdered latex glove was a problem and this was in 2015. We need to, add, to establish the diagnosis is challenging because you need to do a good history and latex skin testing is not available in the U.S. The latex IgE antibody test is not perfect and it's difficult to avoid latex unless you're educated. The other point I want to make is pre-medication. With patients who are allergic to certain products such as intravenous pilogram dye, they can be pre-medicated and prevent an allergic reaction. This does not work with latex allergic patients. So if somebody is going in for surgery, they really have to clearly tell their surgeon and the operating suite has to be latex safe. We can be latex free, but we can be latex safe and they can be um, treated appropriately. Cross-reacting foods have to be avoided and both physician and patient have to be appropriately educated. And I think we have a couple of more slides which will show um, this is uh, non-latex gloves and where you can get them. This is a whole list of companies that have um, latex-free gloves and these are synthetic latex gloves and here are our resources on the American Latex Allergy Association. If you go to their website you can download a questionnaire which you can hand out to your patients which will help you determine if somebody is latex uh, allergic or has a tendency to be the same Asthma and Allergy Foundation and the Mayo Clinic and our last slide shows a classic questionnaire. And I will be happy to answer any questions anybody has. Thank you, Dr. Gosser. That was a wonderful presentation, and we, pre we appreciate your time and energy in preparing it and presenting it this evening. At this time, I will open the line and unmute all lines for questions. So if you would like to ask a question, in just one moment, all lines will be unmuted. Please be aware that if all lines are unmuted, that we can hear any background noise and attempt to keep that at a minimum. If you would like to ask a question, you may also enter it into the control panel window, and I will ask those questions openly for the group. At this time, the majority of lines are just going to get So, I'm sorry, we do have background noise. If you are listening to your own line, you can do star six. I'm watching. And if you would like to ask a question, I leave it on the form. I leave it on the form. I take it out. Because if we get it, we get it. Don't go. 
leave it on. So the I'm sorry, there was a question that was um, accidentally deleted. Again, I'm going to ask that if you are not speaking, you'll please mute your phone. We have a lot of background noise. I can't find it anywhere on the NASA's website. Probably in there somewhere. I don't know if you can call somebody. I'll be right back. The first question I have is the first question I say yes to point that as being cross-reactive. It's about time. So thank you. Do it in that information. And then um, I wanted to say thank you for stating the above. You know, in my story word for word. The next comment comes from Cindy Husky, who says, really wonderful information. Thank you very much for sharing. I do have some background noise, so if you are not Asking a question, so you could personally meet your own. Like I said, it's a very sensitive aspect. Yes. And um, you know, people are applauding. Did I really say? Deborah Scott, you have your yes. Hello. Would like to ask a question? Feel free to do it. Hello. Uh, the question is why why does the AMA not ban latex gloves? Knowing what they know now about how it creates latex allergy and continues to perpetuate latex allergy. I wish I had the So the question was why have latex gloves not been banned? And I'm not sure, Dr. Gotchik, or um, if the American Latex Allergy Association. Yes. I cannot give you an answer for that. Dr. Gotchik, if you would like to share, I did mute the lines because of all the background noise. It was very difficult to hear. So if you do want to ask a question, Dr. Gotchik and uh, my line as the organizer are the only two open. Dr. Gotchik, any word from you as to why latex allergy gloves have not been banned altogether? Um, I, I find it quite interesting that they haven't banned them. I think that, that it's, a, it's a problem. And I don't understand why. I think most of us have better start writing letters to the AMA. Yeah. And I, I do know that there has been um, some legislation put forth in different states, but no federal legislation that I'm aware of at this time. No, there is not. I've, I, I checked that out. There's, the only thing is the FDA does report, does record if a device contains latex, but they don't have anything further beyond that. I, don't I didn't find anything about that. Okay. Uh, the next question is, many of us developed asthma and food allergies in the past. Are there any known or suspected new health issues being identified in known latex allergic patients? No, the major ones are allergic rhinitis, uh, rhinoconjunctivitis, and the asthma. And one of the problems is if you do develop asthma, it can be persistent, as most occupational asthmas are. So if you're exposed to latex, even though you remove it from the environment, you may have persistent airway hyper-responsiveness after you've been removed from the latex uh, environment. So there are no other diseases that are related to it that I'm aware of. Okay. The next question, my daughter has spina bifida and gets red when in contact with latex. Will she li be likely to have a cross-reaction with foods as well? Um, there is a possibility. You just have to be cautious. If you see her having problems with an itchy mouth with the oral allergy syndrome, that would be an indication. And the foods that I would be careful with are banana, avocado, kiwi, and chestnut. Those are the four primary ones. If she's not having any problems with any foods now without any complaints of an itchy mouth or itchy throat, I would let her to continue eating those. Wonderful, thank you. Next question, why is it that many, many people with latex have, who have previously had positive results are now getting negative results when tested? After avoidance with latex for over five years, it is possible for the test to become negative. And it depends on which test they're doing because the questionnaire didn't tell me whether it was the blood test. If it is the blood test, it could get negative over time, especially if you're avoiding contact with latex. Okay. 
Next question, my three-year-old was just diagnosed with latex allergy, never had surgery or exposed to latex before, as we are aware. Is it possible to outgrow latex allergy? That's a tough question. Um, if he's a three-year-old, he might have been exposed in the healthcare, in the daycare setting if he went to daycare, because frequently in the daycare setting they use latex gloves uh, to change the diapers. Now the question is, can he outgrow it? It depends on what kind of reaction he had. If it's an anaphylactic reaction, I would say that that's not a probability. But as you avoid exposure, your symptoms will be less and less, and your blood test will turn, after five years, you may have a negative blood test, but if it's anaphylaxis, you usually don't outgrow that. Wonderful. I do have a comment in regard to the prohibition of latex. Uh, I understand that Connecticut passed prohibiting latex from food service in June of 2015, and Massachusetts has a bill now being heard, and New Hampshire will have a bill put forth this winter. It only addresses food service, but it is making progress, and I appreciate, Mary Catherine, you sharing that information with us. And at Allergy and Asthma Network and the American Latex Allergy Association, we will be happy to uh, send out support for those bills and activate our community to lend their voice to that support as well. Next question, what about mast cell disorder? Isn't that a part of the progression? Um, no, a mast cell disorder or mast cell activation syndrome is a different entity. And those people have allergic reactions to multiple agents from non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs to extremes of exercise to alcohol. So it's, it's a little bit different if you're talking about mast cell activation syndrome. So the mast cells are activated in an allergic reaction, but this is not um, the same as a mast cell activation syndrome. Right. Next question. Where can you report a latex reaction? How can we know the true numbers that are affected if there is no a uh, common place to report. You can, re you can report to the FDA and if you contact Sue Lockwood at the American Latex Allergy Association, she will help you with your reporting. Next question. Um, this is from Mary Catherine as well. She's trying to find out if there are statistics on children specifically. She sees more and more young adults and children with no known risk factors. Is this being studied uh, or any additional information as to why this may be happening? That's, a, uh, that's an interesting commentary. I haven't seen any new literature specifically addressing children other than the children who had spina bifida and the surgery. The only thing that I would look at is, and I don't know any uh, reporting of younger children, but a lot of the toys they have, the koosh balls, the rubber ducky toys, um, some of the, um, like those little toys with the, the giraffes on it and it's the pacifier that the child uses, those are non-rubber latex in many cases. The only area I can think of is the, the daycare setting. And I, that investigator, I'd love her to contact me because I'd like to know uh, where she has seen that information. Okay. Uh, we do have a question from Argentina. Uh, why do allergists recommend to use powder-free and low allergen gloves, knowing that it is the contact with latex independently of inhalation, the one which produces changes in lung cells, and so asthma TH2 mediated? I agree with the speaker, the individual from Argentina, we should avoid all latex and non-latex gloves, at least that's what I advise my patient, because the powdered free latex gloves still elute the latex protein, and there is a risk for patients to develop latex sensitivity. I think we should all go to synthetic latex gloves. I think that that should be our goal in the future. Furthermore, uh, Gabriella says, why wouldn't the allergist actually write a document seriously advising the ban of latex gloves and then uh, CDC recommending to use those gloves, you know, back in the 90s when, every, you know, we were to treat every patient as if they were HIV positive. It seems as if it would be the responsible thing to then move forward with that type of um, public health message. Yeah. 
I, I agree with her. Uh, the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology sent a letter to the AFDA requesting that they ban latex powder, ban cornstarch powder and latex powdered gloves. But we didn't get much pushback on it. I mean, they just they did not follow through. But we did send a letter to the FDA requesting that, and that was on the table. But the FDA did not follow through with it. Okay, next question. Let's put it this way, it's an ongoing battle. Yes. You mentioned there is a possibility to distinguish between a sensitivity and a true allergy. If the blood test comes back negative and a skin test comes back positive, is there still a way to make a definitive determination? The most definitive determination is through the patient's history. That's really critical. If you are in like South America, Europe, Canada, you do have the skin test, which would be positive. Um, in the U.S., we're t entirely dependent on the history, and the history is pretty good because if you look back at the two patients I presented, both of them gave a very good history of being latex allergic. However, that nurse who was in the ICU, nobody could figure out why she was having anaphylaxis because nobody went back to look at what was going on. So it requires a lot of detective work. This new uh, study, which is a component study, um, which they are developing, the Immunocap microarray, will be helpful in distinguishing patients who are sensitive as opposed to those who are allergic. But that's not yet available, and we don't have that available to us to date and that's a problem that's where the allergist has to really do good detective work okay uh, one additional question why does the US not have the skin test would this not be a better way to test for a latex allergy uh, part of the reason is when the skin test was initially developed by Greer laboratories it basically was strong for hep B6 um, the FDA felt that that was not adequate enough to pick up all the patients who were latex allergic because in one of my slides I showed that your patients who have spina bifida react to HEF-B1 and 3. Those who are healthcare workers reacted to the 5, 6, 7, and 8, and the food allergy sensitivity was uh, 8 and 11. So what happens is the FDA felt that the latex um, skin test that was produced was not adequate to identify all patients and Greer Laboratories was in the developmental phase with it and you'll be able to address Tom Greer with some of those questions tomorrow evening to find out you know he may be able to answer that for you. Wonderful. But that, that's my understanding as to why it wasn't accepted as uh, a, a skin test that could be uh, utilized in the US. Okay. Uh, a comment from Marcia Smith at the American Latex Allergy Association in regard to a ban. Certainly the American Medical Association would most likely defer to the Food and Drug Administration in regard to a ban, um, and that would be very challenging to do. And then a question in regard to how can we work um, globally on this particular issue. Certainly Allergy and Asthma Network is uh, well connected across the globe. I am uh, I sit on the board of directors of the Global Allergy allergy and asthma patient platform, and I can assure you that we will take this up uh, at our next quarterly meeting and determine how we can work more effectively, not only across North America, but also Latin America and other countries that are represented here on the line this evening. I think that, again, if we can get consensus statements from the professional medical societies, as well as the patient advocacy organizations, that would be a step in the right direction toward moving policy. <coughs> Okay, great. The next question, can you explain a little more about accelerators and adhesives? I have developed a rash in the area where I wore a latex-free bandage. Hmm. If it was a latex-free bandage, it could be due to occlusion, but you're going to have to find out how the bandage was manufactured and what uh, chemicals it contained because then you could subsequently be patch tested and find out which specific item you were sensitive to. So the key is what company made it, you need to be patch tested to that band-aid and I would contact one of your local allergists to have that done because they would be able to address it. Wonderful. Any other questions at this time? 
Well, I, again, would just like to express our sincere gratitude to Dr. Gawchik for that wonderful overview of latex allergy and such a comprehensive presentation, and, and we so appreciate your time this evening. Also want to say a final thank you to the American Latex Allergy Association, as well as Allergy and Asthma Network staff for the coordination and promotion of this evening's event. And then finally, to our presenting sponsor, Mylan, the manufacturer of EpiPen, and the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, our co-host for this evening. Again, we welcome all of you to stay involved and to stay connected to Allergy and Asthma Network. We are going to be hosting another uh, webinar tomorrow evening on cross-reactivity within latex allergy. And Tom Greer will be on the line as the presenter tomorrow evening. As we close, I believe I see one final question, and, and I wish I had the answer to it. Why aren't there more wonderful doctors like Dr. Gotchik? Again, uh, it, that is a wonderful question, Peggy, and I wish that I could say that we could clone her. But uh, we, again, so appreciate her time and her expertise and uh, willingness to share with us this evening. Thank you all for attending. I will be sending out the recording um, within the next 24 to 48 hours. We welcome your feedback at the conclusion of the seminar tonight. Thank you and have a great evening.